Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Today I am speaking with Razib Khan. Razib is a geneticist and he you can find him on Substack at razib.substack.com and he podcasts and writes about biology, genetics, science, politics, some of the culture war stuff and he's got a lot of interesting takes. Hi Razib, thank you for coming on. Hey, nice to meet you, man. Yeah, thank you again. And I guess I originally got a hold of you and I was hoping to speak to you about some of the stuff you've done on IQ and um, you know, some of the culture war stuff, but I guess the giant orange elephant in the room is uh, what happened on the 6th. So maybe if you want to give some of your thoughts on that, like I'm not blaming anyone else except for, you know, Trump and the people who did it. Like that's, I'm not trying to put like some of the culture war stuff is what fed that. Um, I think I mentioned to you, you know, that I was overseas and when I got back in 2014, the first thing I like all this stuff I noticed about, like secular blasphemy, I always say to friends and stuff, like there's an overcorrection coming and we got to stop this. And I think what happened on the 6th was that overcorrection. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have anything uh, deeper and insightful to say about that. Um, basically, I think there are issues relating to information technology, polarization, um, just random things uh, to do with... Uh, just the current moment in American history with the election of Trump uh, that just kind of all came together in a contingent whirlwind and, you know, stuff like this happens in history and it just doesn't usually happen to Americans. And that's why we're shocked. I think, I mean, okay, fine. It doesn't happen in America, but I mean, you had the civil war. That was a hundred, but it was, you know, that was, that was like a long time ago, right? Yeah. No, no I get it. It was, it was a while ago, but again, my contention on this is it's just, we're losing tethers to reality on all sides. Like this is not a right or left thing. Like you know, if you've got biologists arguing whether or not, you know, sex is a social construct, like let alone gender. And then you've got, you know, take anything you want from MAGA. I mean, like, we're losing our tethers to reality. And it's, I mean, I realize a polar, I mean, that's where I think polarization is coming from. The thing with social media, like I, I get that but maybe I'm biased because I work in tech. It's, it's like, that's the medium. But if the stuff underlying it hadn't gone so wrong, then maybe the mediums would have been used better. Well, I mean, do you think maybe the enlightenment period was a weird aberration? No. If you're, I don't know if you've read David Deutsch's book, the beginning of infinity. No, I have not. Okay. He talks about pockets of enlightenment and mention these kind of things. But if you look back to the Greeks, uh, you know, call it the golden age of Islam. There's been pockets of time where people have thought about these ideas. And I think if you have people left a look, like if you have, if people have the time, they can come up, they'll come up with these similar thoughts. And, you know, I think during the enlightenment period, like it built on everything else and you had science flourishing. So you had better tools and I think it solidified them more and it made them better than, you know, free speech and liberties that came out of the Enlightenment were better than anything the Greeks had. I don't think it was an aberration. I just think it was natural progress. I mean, there's a guy in, uh, I read about this recently. There's a guy in Ethiopia. Uh, his name was Jacob. And this was a hundred or so years before Locke and Kant. Mm -hmm. And he sat in a cave in Ethiopia and he, he came up with similar ideas. So I don't think this was an aberration. I think this is, if given the chance and we can stop and think, I think we will start coming up with these ideas. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's reasonable. I mean, but you need to have uh, the scaffold, the framework, and um, like how sustainable is that civilization's rise and fall? And so, I mean, not to be Debbie Downer about it, but, um, you know, our republic has gone on for over 200 years, and people were skeptical when it was founded. And, um, you know, all good things must come to an end. I'm not saying it's now, but um, I think we need to keep some perspective um, that the era of history and kind of the Whiggish progress oriented view has been historically kind of the minority view. No, it's, it's true. We, we, there's, it's always been, um, I think, I think it was Douglas Murray who said it like freedom's not always been a very popular you know, choice. Like people just want to go about their lives, do their stuff and not really think about it. It's only for, it's only because of, you know, a select few that get things going. But I mean, this was something that uh, it's in Greg Lukianov to write about. And I mean, I, like I said, I've mentioned it a couple of times. It's, we don't talk enough about those principles per se anymore. 
where it's like, okay, well, free speech, we have the First Amendment, so Twitter can ban Trump because you're a private company, they can do whatever they want, it's not covered by the First Amendment. If we'd actually spent more time pushing the principles instead of the laws that came out of them, I don't think they would have been as eroded as badly as they are now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. Um, I mean, in terms of what happened last week, though, um, I don't think anyone predicted it, and I don't think it was a plan, right? So I think we need to be careful about, um, you know, drawing deterministic implications from it. Um, I just think it was a time and place that came together because of all the crazy things that have been happening over the last four years, a lot of it having to do with Trump's particular personality. The planning, whatever, I, I don't even want to get into that because, I mean, you know, you're seeing all this stuff, oh, this happened on Parler, you know, Parler's gone now. Um, but, yeah, Trump incited them, and, you no, know, I have... I agree with you there that like the last four years did contribute to this. Um, but I'd say that the, you know, my take on this was around the late nineties was when you had the shift from um, universal values to identity based politics start coming into, uh, you know, departments in the academy, like, so like administrations and things like that, and also coming into politics. Uh, uh, there was, I think it was Zach Goldberg who did that study about the race and racism and, you know, mentioned the, in the media and stuff. And, you know, start, starting on Obama's first term, it just started going up and up and up. Yeah, everything that Trump did was crazy. And I, like, again, this is, I don't think it's a right and left thing. I think it's, I think our biggest problem is since like the late 90s and especially since 9 11, we've become narrative driven instead of fact driven. And whatever facts are done out there, it's counterfactual. Or, I don't know, maybe I am being too pessimistic. I don't know. No, I mean, I think 9-11 is a really good, um, really good watershed moment. I mean, I think the way I would uh, maybe like disagree with you a little would be that it's always been narrative driven and fact driven, but the balance shifts and the shift has happened where the narrative drives the facts rather than the other way around. Uh, that's fine. I mean, and I'm not saying that there wasn't narrative before. There always has been. But I think that before there was, like you said, they, they were putting... They were using the facts to form the narrative, not the narrative to shape the facts. Yeah, no, um, maybe, maybe, yeah. I mean, it, the 90s were weird in their own way, but I think, I think on the whole, I would agree with you. Like I said, I was hoping to talk to you about some of the, you know, the, the biology stuff. Uh, I'd just spoken with Colin Raitt um, about sex and gender. And I know you touch a bit on that, but you're also doing some stuff on like IQ. Uh, I don't want to specifically talk about any of the science or things, but this is again, part of the problem. I think like how, like having these conversations now, like, you know, if you touch the IQ thing, it's like a third rail. If you touch the gender thing, it's like a third rail. Like um, how do you navigate that? Um, close your eyes and hope for the best. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, if you have, um, Okay, like the science war. So you had the, whatchamacallit, um, intelligent design coming in and there was, you know, biology departments and scientists and, you know, fought back and said, no, this is not science. But now when you have biology departments, you know, wondering whether or not sex is a social construct or not, what's to stop? Like, who's there to defend another incursion by intelligent design? Um... And no one. I mean, you've talked talked to Holland, so um, you know it's 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 not a good scene right now. Um, I think, uh, yeah, that that old view has few few takers right now. There's a lot of groupthink, a lot of conformity, and um, I don't really have anything positive to say and hopeful. Um, it's just the way it is. Oh, well, that's yeah. There goes biology. But I mean, again, if you're looking at you know, well, COVID, like, this is a perfect example. Like science works. They got that vaccine out in a year. They did. They did. The, the science works, but like, look at the way they're rolling it out and with all the bureaucracy. That's got to be fixed. But if you did it based on, you know, subjective facts and, uh, well, it, it affects, um, you know, there's racism inherent in the system. And if you were, if they were working on the vaccine in that process, it would have never got done. I mean, can't, like, isn't there a way to just say, okay, look, let's rally behind this and say that this works. What you're doing doesn't. I mean, is, 
or are there no more adults left in the room? I mean, that's what I think. That's what people thought that COVID was a was a shock to our system. It was the real world coming back, and that would change things. And yet, we're still talking about what happened on the sixth of January and um, protests and riots over the summer. So, I think what that tells us is that human ideology is frankly stronger than the natural world at this point. Okay. Um, do you want to take any guesses as to like? why that like why that shifts happen I, mean, I think part of it is like maslow's hierarchy where people think that they have their material wants taken care of and they're looking for meaning in the world and kind of flailing you know um and i don't know what to say about that i think i'd reply to you i'm not sure but there was a few other people in there like, i don't want to bring an equation into this like like an equivalency but i want to look at it as i'm not saying what happened on the sixth or what happened over the summer was close to what happened on the sixth I think there is an equivalency to be looked at and that's you had Trump saying all is insanity since you know the election and even before like how they were planning to steal it and all that and he fired his people up but over the summer you had Democrats kind of giving the okay for violence for political means I mean I know that in August they started denouncing violence but they never specifically said okay you know antifa black lives matter i mean biden said antifa was just an idea but like again the, the part of the narrative thing like these like you know the mega people who stormed the capital they had their narrative going and these people like they saw another narrative that said okay it's okay to attack federal buildings it's okay to attack courthouses it's okay to get violent when you see feel you're unheard and they were told they were unheard they had their truth no no they had their truth i mean i mean that basically I, I think what happened over the summer created a permission structure um and reduced the legitimacy of you know law enforcement in a lot of ways and um i think a lot of us were worried that that was going to happen and it did happen and i think this is like a um a bidding war escalation now uh because once you open the door um, it's hard to close it, you know. When you make exceptions for your team, uh, other people are going to make exceptions for their team, and that's what I think is happening right now. And I think will continue to happen. I don't see it stopping, but I mean, I hope it would. For myself, it's always been. I'm, I've been just saying there's an overcorrection coming, and I, you know, I hope that this is the end of it. But I don't see it. Like I mean, like you mentioned the vaccine rollout, and then that uh, there's a speech. Or there's some comments from Biden going around today where he said, um, you know, on the whole, they're very, very, very good. But there was a few seconds where he just included identity, like we're going to do it for black, uh, Latino, uh, Asian and Native Americans. And, you know, he started by specifying those. Like, he said, I, I hope the overcorrection would would jolt people back. But like, how do you think you, we pull ourselves back from the brink of this? I think the way we're going to pull ourselves back from the brink of this is some sort of financial crisis where we start to start thinking about money and paying the bills rather than all these ideological concerns. Like this is it's kind of fun and games in a way. I think people think it's a great video game. The, the financial concerns, like, but this, the bill that he was talking about or the, the program that he was, talk, he was talking about was, you know, we're about building back businesses. So that's trying to fix the economy, but they're doing that on a race based lens. Like it's, yeah, well, I mean, so here's the thing, um, you know, a lot of these identity politics politicians, they do a lot of talking, we'll see how they execute. Um, I'm skeptical they're really going to do much, although they will talk a lot. If they do do things, there's going to be serious problems, because one, we have a finite amount of money, and this is obviously unfair and racist. Yeah, no, totally. But I mean, it's okay, I, I, you know, there's that, but you have the schools now saying, I, I think it's in New York, I think it's in Washington. Um, California probably too. I'm not 100 percent sure about that. Where they're saying they're going to get rid of grading. This is again, like I think it's part of the same problem. Like you, you can't have, you know, if you're getting rid of grading for high school kids and then they're going into college, well, when they get into work and they get into, you know, some of them are going to go into finance. If they haven't passed math, but they're working in finance, like how? Forget working on race-based policies. Like who's making these policies now? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it, what's going to happen is people are going to realize that this is not sustainable and, you know, um, finance is going to have to hire immigrants. I mean, this is just, I, I totally agree with you. It's 
not sustainable. It's horrible. But um, I think that right now our political leaders aren't going to see the consequences because they're old and they're insulated. Um, and so they're going to say, well, Americans can't do these jobs. Let's have immigrants do it. I think that's ultimately what's going to happen if I have to predict. Yeah, maybe. But if it starts crumbling, will immigrants want to come here and work? I mean, mm-hmm. you're, yeah. you're already having people come to the States getting degrees and then going back to their home countries. Yeah, no, I think, I think that the whole system could topple and fall over, but they're looking, they're looking right in front of their nose. Like I, I see so many different problems like compounded on top of each other. Okay. If you had to guess, like I said, I give you my little timeline. Uh, when would you think the shift happened? Or do you think I'm like, do you think I'm way off base or do you think I'm kind of close? Or? Well, I mean, I, you know, I've looked at Goldberg's work. The, the big shift happened in terms of um, survey data in the, in the mid teens, but obviously the roots and the foundations were earlier. So if you read some of Heather McDonald's work from 20 years ago, they're pretty prophetic. Um, all these ideas were there. They were just needed to be deployed. And they, that's what happened five years ago. Okay. You say five, I'd say about, seven or eight like 2013 2014 because that's when you really started noticing it go crazy on the campuses yeah but it, it didn't it didn't spread i mean the, the campuses already had crazy ideas for a long time you know they came and went they came and went and a lot of us were hoping that it was just going to be like that no but okay again take a look at zach goldberg's work if you look at the media if you look at i think he did new york times washington post la times and uh, i can't remember the fourth one sorry uh, and just the mentions of the words racism, racist, white supremacist. And that started going up um, around 2008, 2009, that it jumped a, a bit in 2010, then it just went, kept going up straight up until 2016. So if it's in the media, it's already out of the university. So I mean, like, that's why I'm saying it. Yeah. You know, the, I, think it per, I think it burst on the university in 2013 because it started coming into high schools around 2010. And again, some high schools yeah. in some locations. Yeah, so it's percolated down. Basically, the battles were had maybe in the first half of the teens, and they won. And now, you know, corporations, the institutions, they're all taken over by identity politics. And um, identity politics, like, it has a fixed shelf life. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to end this year, next year, two years. But I think it will end because... Um, it's expensive, and it's kind of a, a luxury idea, as Rob Henderson would say. Well, yeah, it's it's definitely like the the um, there was a piece out today, I think, from Heterodox Academy, and that was, um, it was Musa Al Gharib, if I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, you know, like, like with everything else, just don't agree with everything, but you know, he he brings up that point, like the people who are making these claims of privilege, this and that, they're majority of them are white, coming from you know Ivy League schools, and they're forgetting that they're, you know, like they're insanely privileged themselves. Yeah. Well, I mean, but the, you know, we're talking oppression Olympics and, and victimology here. People are going to, um, they're going to figure out a way they're not right. Like what's their angle? Like, how are they oppressed? Yeah. Well, wow. that's, you, you've made victimhood, um, why well, you made victimhood currency. And again, that's been about 20 years. And it's not, you know, it's like, here's where the, for me, the issue lies more than anything else. It's like, okay, well, the woke left, it's okay. You saw with the MAGA right, there's victimization there like crazy as well. It's, and, you know, they've got like, not even just MAGA right, but even like, you know, if you go a little bit closer to the center from that, they've got their own narrative machines. They've got all that, but they're all being trained in the same institutions. They're all coming out thinking that way so they're pushing their narrative like i mean we're like i said like it's all counterfactuals now yeah i mean we're living in um it's all it's all idealism right rather than materialism and so i guess what i'm trying to say is like when there's a material concern idealism collapses and so that might be what we need um i think what both of us would hope for would that be that arguments and that ideas would would really determine the outcome but i don't see that happening unfortunately i hope i'm wrong well, yeah, okay neither do i that's okay, that, that this is my this has been my biggest worry and everyone's like okay you know there's there is a growth in white supremacy and i'm being talking the real kind not you know the made-up stuff um 
But that's, there's my concern. Like we've had this focus on identity politics, and if it keeps getting pushed, and there is, and there is an economic need right now with you know COVID laying waste to the economy. Um, if you, I mean, they, if you they keep pushing that white, if they keep pushing that identity politics, you're going to get further. You're going to get larger white identity politics happening than you do now, and you know that's it's not going to be a good thing in a majority white country especially a majority white country with nukes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been, I said the same thing in 2016 before Trump was elected. So we're on the same page. I mean, ultimately for a lot of white liberals, this is play acting. They can revert to another identity if the situation is needed. Let's be frank. I mean, so, so, so when they talk about white supremacy, unless they themselves are white supremacists, they don't know what they're talking about. It gets, it's a weird verbal abstraction for them, right? Yeah, but also if you look at the way that, again, it's definitions. We've, you know, like I said, we're losing a lot of things. Um, white supremacy to someone in um, Antifa or someone, not just someone going to the BLM protest, but someone from the organization is, you know, capitalism. It's the, okay, obviously the, the police, for, you know, force the legal system, but it's, it's the academy is white supremacy. I mean, you had Princeton's pre- president putting out a letter saying, you know, we were built on white supremacy, you know, we're white supremacists, um, you know, systematic, systemically racist uh, organization. They, when I think, when I say white supremacy, I'm talking about, you know, the asshats in Charlottesville with the Tiki torches and the, you know, the cargo shorts, the KKK, neo-Nazis, like, you know, that's, that's white supremacy, but, they've got an academic definition that doesn't fit with reality either. It's not about reality. It's about kind of manipulating memes yeah. and these positional games, right? So I think that's what we're talking about. And my point, I think that I'm trying to get across is I think, you know, when material conditions are going to matter again, this stuff fades away, right? So we know that for sure. Now the other option is we can argue them out of it mm-hmm. through reason. But um, once you basically say reason is not a acceptable tool it's hard to use that tool yeah uh, but like I, again i'm going to be like i said maybe i'm more pessimistic than you i think you're saying if there is you know when when push comes to shove with the economy people are just going to put this aside and then they're going to get together and try to fix it i don't know i th- i'm afraid that they the divide is going to be so great that they're going to blame each other and it's it's going to come to violence and it's going to come to something horrific. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's quite probable. I mean, that's been human history. I mean, we might be, we might be reverting back to the mean. Yeah. Which would, you know, like I keep saying, I said this a few times over the last few years, it's, you know, 500 years or a thousand years from now, a future David Deutsch is going to be writing about us as a pocket of enlightenment that went out. You know, like it's again, competing narratives, but, I'm going to give you like a pretty mild example of this. The Republican woman from Baltimore lost Kim Classic. Um, forget her. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. She, in December, she put out a series of tweets. Oh, so-and-so's wife is Chinese. So-and-so is married uh, to a Chinese person and just kept on going. I found that a little racist. Uh, you know, like, what the hell are you doing? But no one on the other side, as far as I could tell, had a you know moral leg to stand on because what's going on in Virginia with the schools are Asians, you know, because there's too many Asians, what's going on in Harvard. Oh, there's too many Asians. So white supremacy is uh, spreading in Washington state. Asians are now considered, you know, it's white and Asians and then people of color. So who's, who's going to stand up to that and who's got the moral authority to stand up to someone like that when you're spreading your own version of it? No, I mean, I agree. I mean, they're, they're basically inversions. They use the same superstructure um, for different moral ends, but um, you know, once you start operating with this currency, it legitimizes, legitimizes it. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's right. And um, you know, I've been on this case for a while, and I've been alarmed. And to be frank, um, we lost. Oh, we, I think we lost a while ago, but I, you know, I think there was, I think there was a chance to bring some back, but we're losing ground day by day. So okay, you, you said yeah, I know you you've mentioned you've been writing, writing about this for a while. Like what what was the catalyst for you to say, okay, something's completely wrong here? 
Hmm. You know, I've always been kind of more on the libertarian right. Um, I wouldn't call myself libertarian anymore, but um, skeptical of this identitarian stuff. So it's just always been something that I've been opposed to. And, you know, it was a normal thing to be opposed to it 10, 20 years ago, not like some sort of taboo, edgy, you know. Uh, I mean, I've always had my own views and not been defined by my identity uh, racially or religiously since I'm not religious and and all that stuff so um it's just never been a good fit for me and uh, i've always expressed my views about that but uh recently it's just kind of spitting into the wind yeah i mean and you know you mentioned that like okay so i'm up in canada you're in the states but like i my family moved to canada when i was six and my dad specifically moved us because we were staying with uh, um and an uncle when we first got here um and my dad looked at the neighborhoods they were in and it, they were starting to be uh, South Asian, you know, started to get ghettoized with South Asians. And my dad was like, no, I don't want to live here. It's like, I didn't leave India to bring my family to live in little India. He's like, I want to live in Canada. And so you know, we moved to a predominantly white neighborhood. Um, and it wasn't even like, it was so much white. It was just Canadian. It was, there was a mix of people. Um, so yeah, I've never had that identity politics thing. And it, you know, there's racism in Montreal, there's racism in Canada, and I faced that, but it wasn't until the first politically correct movement, you know, political correctness stuff in the late 80s, where I was made to focus on my race by well-meaning, you know, liberals, like quote-unquote liberals. Like, I find that worse, some skinhead calling me a packy or something. Like, I, I find that condescending, patronizing bigotry of low expectations and it's not soft it's hard bigotry like i find that so much worse than some guy just being blatantly racist towards me yeah um i mean they're both bad um oh yeah no i'm not saying either one's good but like i said that i can deal with the first the second mm -hmm. one's harder to deal with mm -hmm. and i think you're gonna have to deal with it for a while because we're in this moment i mean i used to joke like when i first heard about it uh so I guess it was like 89. So I was just starting university and I was working at an insurance company and I was hearing some of this stuff and I'd, I'd come into work. And I'm like, Hey guys, I can't be racist. Cause I'm Brown. And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I was explaining it to them and people were work, like, where are you getting these crazy ideas? <laughs> you know, they were kind of shocked that I was telling them I'm getting out of school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, we live in, in, we live in a time that's so crazy that sometimes I forget what I look at, what I wrote like 10, 20 years ago or 10, 15 years ago. And, everything was so different you know remember obama was opposed to gay marriage in 2008 <laughs> it's not only that okay like the, okay the election fraud stuff what, okay, what trump did is insane like i'm not trying to defend any of that stuff like it's complete insanity as far as i'm concerned but there here's my problem is again you built up a narrative for four years that the election was stolen and that it's possible to be done i think in september of last year like Hillary Clinton had given another interview where she said, Oh, Donald basically stole the election from me. So it was just, you know, a couple months before the election. You played into his hands. He's like, Oh, no, no, no. See, they tried to get me because they said the election is fixed. They know elections can be fixed. So this one was fixed. You know, it's, it's a battle for narrative and it's a battle. Like no one's, no one's working off any basis in reality anymore. It, there's a basis in reality, but the narrative is really important. The narrative is primary, right? I mean, it's 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 frustrating and unsatisfying to put both siderism both siderism out there, but that's the empirical truth. And it's like I don't want to put both sides out there to like make equivalencies. Like I said, what happened to the Capitol is way worse than what happened this summer. But there's an equivalency in the mentality, and I think that gets lost in the mayhem, and no one wants to look at that equivalency in the me mentality. There's a few people that are looking, uh, but um, I think there needs to be some distance from the Trump era, to be entirely frank. I mean, there shouldn't be. We should just evaluate the evidence, but I think that's what the, the issue is. Like He's sucking the oxygen out of everything. Okay, I'll give you that, but I have I look back at the last election, like the 2016 election, and the frenzy that the media had put themselves into, even before Trump, I mean, you know, they called Mitt Romney, uh, like, you know, basically implied he was a Nazi and like, you know, binders full of women and like, you know, they derided McCain. Like they, they, they made, they demonize those people. Like, I, who on yeah. the Republican ticket do you think 
they would not have lost their minds over. Yeah, I mean, that's a fair point. And um, I mean, I've, that's that's just the way the game is rigged, though. You know, the media has always been like this, and it's gotten worse, but that's the way the game is rigged. Um, and, you know, Bush won twice, so it's doable. You know? yeah, well, okay, uh, Bush won, I think, because of, you know, Gore was so bad, but then it came down to, what, 500 votes in Florida or something like that? So... So, so, so I would, I would guess that you know, one thing that we're seeing is they're mediating institutions, our objective central institutions in society are giving up those objective positions, and that's causing part of the issue. But you know, once once it's out of Pandora's box, how do you put it back in? I mean, I mean, we could establish a ministry of truth. No, no, we 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 shouldn't. I mean, okay, the ministry of truth, like the the Twitter banning of Trump. You know, you had Merkel this morning saying it was a bad thing. I think a lot of leaders now are worried, like, will they get banned? I can see where, you know, did he incite violence? I think he did. Did he incite a riot? I think he did. I think he was, I think he was out of bounds, but I just read something recently, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, where someone put that, you know, like, and I think there was the, the Justice Department said there wasn't enough to charge Trump for incitement. So I don't know. Like, if the Justice Department doesn't think there's enough, but then that's Trump's Justice Department, um, was Twitter in the right to, to ban him? I mean, you know, it's it's a private business. I mean, was it right? That's a moral question is different than a legal question, right? Um, the problem is we don't know what these social media companies know. And part of that is due to the fact that they're private businesses. And part of it is due to um, going back about 10 years, Facebook did some publication on some of the things that it found out. And a lot of scientists got super outraged. And so Facebook basically said, we're never going to talk publicly again about this again, which is a huge problem because we don't know what Facebook knows, but it knows a lot. It knows a lot about American behavior and world behavior, people across the world. Same thing with Twitter, um, although it's a much smaller company. So they do know certain things and they were scared of certain things, I'm assuming. And that's why they coordinated and they are private companies so they can do it. It's legal. Um, the issue that I think we're all worried about is the downstream consequences. I do think that um, world leaders should not depend on Twitter to communicate with people. That's just bad uh, that they've gotten into that position. Um, shows how short-sighted they are. Okay, no, like, like, getting you know world leaders tweeting or whatever. It's 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 silly. Um, you know, if Twitter went back to what it was, was basically I think it was originally like go you know, a review system for restaurants and vacations, and it wasn't meant to be what it is now. Um, that's why it was like so you know 140 characters or whatever. But yeah, no, no, they they shouldn't be relying on Twitter or anything like that. I mean, if you want to put out news releases. You want to put out stuff like that so you get it to a certain segment of the population, that's fine. But, you know, what Donald Trump was doing should not have been done whatsoever. Like, that, that was insanity. But, and I get, I'm not trying to talk about the legality of it. Like, I, when you're, you're talking about the downstream stuff. That's like the fact that they could, okay, forget even Trump. There was all kinds of other accounts that got shut down. Um, people talk, were talking about this podcast. I don't know it, but they said it was a lefty podcast. Um, they were just anti-woke, but they were completely lefty and they got shut down. But what happened to Parler? You know, it got kicked off the app store and they lost their web hosting. Or Citibank saying they're no longer taking donations for the GOP. So here, here's the thing with Citibank. Um, there's a Citibank China. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I guess the, the Chinese government's okay, but the GOP is not. So I think, you know, we need to actually step back and think about like where these decisions are coming from and what's motivating them. And I think those discussions will be had in due time. Well, I hope so. But when they're talking about making a domestic terrorism bill and things like that, I don't know if there's going to be the room to have those discussions when they're going to be focused on other stuff. I mean, it's not going to be talking about the domestic terrorism bill, but I don't, I don't think that that will pass to be frank. Um, it's overkill. Um, and we already had an experience with the war on terror and the Patriot Act. So, you know, we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that that's going to go to more than the talk stage. I hope it, I, I see it coming in, but I, I, I kind of expect a skeptical, like you said, it will pass in, but I am worried about it. My bigger fear is that it won't pass, but it will be 
kind of like an unwritten thing where okay we're going to look at this you know so they, i don't i'm not saying they're going to do things like rendition or anything like that but i think they'll they'll give themselves a freer hand i don't know maybe i mean there's always there's always there's always discretion um the, the powers that be always have discretion so um you know that's on us to keep them in check right and the problem right now is the us is um <laughs> You know, there's not much of an us. No, there isn't. I mean, there, there's several us's. I've, I've been saying this for a long while, and I've said it pretty much since I came back from overseas. It's there is no right and left anymore. There, there is, you know, there's no. It's it's not that divide anymore. It's a divide of, you know, there's two different kinds of authoritarianism going, maybe more. You know, everyone's got their own version of centrism. I think you need a dividing line now between do you want to be authoritarian or do you want to be like you know libertarian, like not in the you know libertarian party sense, but just you know do you want enlightenment values? I th I think we need to shift that. You know, like you said, get away from a, a, you know identity based on skin color and all that, but to have uh, and even ide ideological identity can get into a huge problem, but. You know, try to push that that view of okay. Either you're gonna have an authoritarian view of the world, or you're gonna have a libertarian view of the world, where we can discuss. And I, I, I don't know. I think we need to have that shift fairly quickly. I mean, if we don't have that shift, we're gonna be going down a very dark path. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't know if we can swerve at this point. I hope we can. Okay, we're both being uh, yeah, this is gonna be quite pessimistic for people. So, a a a any like, I mean, but, but that's uh, that's the time we're in. Like, let's be real, right? Yeah, no, I know. I I know it. Look, I'm not I'm not very hopeful for any quick fix or any immediate fix. And I'm very skeptical of anyone who's offering me one. Like the the MAGA thing and then uh, Antifa. Um, you know, I'm just gonna use Antifa as and we use MAGA and Antifa as a collective term for everything. They're no longer adults. It's children. It's they both want all or nothing. There's no room for compromise. There's no room for okay. You know what? We can do this now, and then in five years, you know, we can have to do that for five years, and we can do something else. And like, but both sides act like children. Both sides are saying it's all or nothing, and they're the loudest voices. And sometimes I wonder if maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing if like all the social media companies just nuke themselves. Well, I mean we lived in a world without social media before, so it would be manageable. Oh no, it'd be manageable. Okay. For myself. Okay. I like social media and I'm never going to want to, you know, like I, I jokingly kind of say that it would be okay. Um, you know, again, I think you, we need an Areopagitica 2.0 to make the arguments that Milton made for the uh, printing press to be made for um, social media. We're always going to use, we had a world without social media, but, for myself, social media, okay, I was overseas and I got a thing saying, join this group for people who'd worked in Bosnia. And I didn't even know what it was. And it ended up, I ended up joining Facebook. I had no clue what Facebook was because, you know, I was stuck in Kabul when I got that email. And so that's how I joined social media. So for me, social media was that, like I was connecting with friends from high school. I remember one year for New Year's Eve, I had a friend from Australia, a friend from Spain, a friend from Singapore, and another one from UK. And this is, you know, we were all people who knew each other in high school and college, and we met up um, in Spain for New Year's Eve, which was awesome. Like, social media is great for that, and it should be that. Um, you know, I don't want it nuked, but I, I don't know. Like I, like I said, I, I, like I, I don't know. I'm just rambling, sorry. <laughs> No, I think what you're getting at is that social media has positive externalities and negative externalities, and, and you know the balance is what's important. Um, obviously, it can't really be nuked, but I think it can be constrained and just kind of handled in a more rational way. And I think part of it is going to be just a cultural learning process. So, for example, you know, Facebook is not what it was ten years ago. Like, you know, it's a boomer boomer tech. You know. So, you know, kids don't use it um, in any serious way. And like Twitter is used by only a minority of the population. So um, I think we need to keep in perspective that not all of this has taken off to the same extent and it's being used differently and it's all evolving over time. 
Oh no, it's okay. Well, I think what Twitter is like um, three hundred and fifty million users worldwide, something like that. So it's no, it's it's tiny. Um, you know what? Facebook's the largest. I think what like around a billion. Or I thought Facebook was a two. A two billion. Hmm. Okay. I, like I said, I haven't looked at the numbers in a while. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's, I it's still okay. Up, um, two point seven mm-hmm. billion active users. So that's like the thirty five percent of the world's population. I mean, a lot of the adult. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so yeah, no, I know. I get that it's okay. I get that Twitter and all that's not real world, but it has real world consequences. And it, it, like, that's the thing. You know, when people say, oh, well, it's not really the real world, it's Twitter. I'm like, okay, but you know what? It exists in the real world. And when Macy's will pull a plate that says, you know, skinny jeans, regular jeans, and mom jeans because someone complained that that's fat shaming. On Twitter, yeah, yeah, no, no, it, 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 you know, it's got an effect. It does, it does. It, a lot of it is silly, and some of it is disturbing. Um, my only point is, you know, stuff can change fast when people start opting out. You know, when it starts to become less cool, and so um, let's just see what another ten years brings. Um, it could be a way worse, but I mean. I, Twitter has had issues with engagement for many years, increasing it. Like people get fed up with it quite quickly. So um, I think we need to keep it in perspective how much worse it can get. Like this might be the worst. Yeah, uh, with a thing like Twitter. But I mean, if you have, we're, you're getting generations now that are that are going to grow up, you know, using social media. Like you know, so they're they're born into social media. Like like myself like i said i joined in 2005 so i was 2005 2006 something like that so you know i was in my 30s when i joined twitter um uh, sorry facebook uh but yeah so i mean you're gonna have generations that are growing up using it and who knows what the next social media is and who knows if you have elon musk's neural link going in that might fix things or might make worse than things worse but yeah i see it evolving but i i just hope that my okay my best hope is that it maintain as much of a lid on the crazy as possible until we can get this sorted out. And then I think things will be a lot better, but I'm, you know, if I see it all, if it all goes to shit, it won't surprise me. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I think it's an accelerant, right? But ultimately we need to focus on what's going on with us rather than the social media. And like, we are the ones that are accelerating through it. Even if Twitter is kind of the medium or the current tool that's being used. Yeah. And again, it's, that's okay. You, you see it on Twitter. Okay. It's Twitter, Twitter, but you'll see, you, you had it from the American psychology, um, you know, whatever the psychology association, like the APA. And then you had it from a um, um, New England journal, of, uh, was it New England journal of medicine, but you know, there, there's coming up pushback to CBT and, you know, you're having woke therapists when you say you have to take a look at yourself and, you know, people start examining and whatever, or some people decide to go to therapy. If the meth, like if the methodology is broken and you're using like a, you know, using something like CBT from everything I've read about it and, you know, seen about it and you know, Luke Yonoff and uh, Coddling the American Mind, he talks about it. It seems like a really good thing, but if you corrupt that or if you have a, you know, identity based therapy that comes out, you're not going to be really helping anyone. Yeah, but I mean, some things aren't about helping. I mean, that's, I think, part of what we're getting at. Like, there's a lot of performance. There's a lot of, like, kind of, like, um, signaling that's going out there. And none of it's real. It's all positional. It's all kind of, like, we're dead in the water and in place right now as a culture. And I don't know what the next step is. Like, think about, you know, going to the moon or in the 19th century, the spirit of discovery. We don't have that right now. What we have is dunking on each other on social media. (laughs) We need that conflict, but we don't. Like people don't have that conflict, like, and I'm, I don't mean we we need to go discover a new continent or whatever. But we've we're basically amusing ourselves to death. Yeah, I mean this is this is like straight out of some like science fiction dystopia. Um, but you know this is where we're at. I mean opioids, social media, obesity, all of these things are kind of like wrapped up into one package, in my opinion. 
Look, I don't want to keep you too, too much longer. Uh, if you've got any last words to say on the, uh, on the current state of the culture war, if you've got advice for people on how to get out of it um, or how to at least mitigate it, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so one thing that I would say is like read some history and have some deep perspective. Appreciate, you know, in a Steven Pinker way, like the, the gifts we've been given and the comforts that we have that can help somewhat and just focus on the small things I think around you because you can't change the world, but you can change your own life. And that kind of sounds like schmaltzy therapy talk, but it's true. I don't know. Yeah. I, I agree with you with that. You know, like I've, I've said, it's you know, do like local things and look at like your, look at what's gone. You know, look like try to fix things around you better. Not the, not the Jordan Peterson clean your room thing, but like try to fix things around you so they work better because that affects you more on a day-to-day basis than whoever the leader of your country is. Anyways, uh, thank you very much for coming on, Rosa. If you want to let people know where they can get a hold of you, where um, you know they can follow you, uh, go ahead and I'll put the links in the description. Sure. So the easiest place um, to find all my stuff is Razib.com. Uh, but um, I'd really check out my Substack, Razib.substack.com right now. That's what I'm really focusing on in the near future. But if you go to Razib.com, you'll find links to my Twitter, uh, my RSS feeds, my various blogs, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Well, again, thank you very much for coming on. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And I'll be back.